I invite you to uh, be a part of this responsive invocation in which we are in effect reciting, although Paul's really the one doing it in the original, Luther's famous words about how his faith is rooted in scripture, etc. So, Paul. Today we remember those who have forged the path of faith that we still walk today. Sola fide, by faith alone. Sola scriptura, by scripture alone. Sola gratia, by grace alone. Sola Cristo, through Christ alone. Sola dedo gloria, glory to God alone, this day and every day. Amen. In a moment, I'm going to read a book to you, and you're going to be able to see the pictures up on the screen. But my Uncle Ed, back in Ohio, fell on Thursday, and he broke his hip. And I was really sad, and I want to thank the choir for prayers. But the good thing is, on Friday, the doctors were able to fix his hip with surgery. And that made me really happy. And it also reminded me of a book I had just read for grown-ups by Pastor Henry Nowen. And you know what he said in the book? He said that we are all broken, but we can rise out of our brokenness with God. Now, I don't think he meant that we're all broken like we have a broken hip or a broken arm, but maybe kind of that our feelings are hurt or maybe our thoughts are broken, but with God, we can rise up out of that. And then that reminded me of another book. It's about 14 books I want to cover this morning. That, no, not really. This is the last one. It reminded me of another book called After the Fall. How Humpty Dumpty Got Back Up Again. And this book was written and illustrated by Dan Santat, who went to school right up here at Cam Heights and over to Cam High. And now you can enjoy the pictures as I read After the Fall, How Humpty Dumpty Got Back Up Again. Thank you, Mrs. Benny, for the photos. My name is Humpty Dumpty. This was my favorite spot, high up on the wall. I know it's an odd place for an egg to be, but I loved being close to the birds. Then one day I fell. I'm sort of famous for that part. Folks called it the Great Fall, which sounds a little grand. It was just an accident, but it changed my life. Fortunately, all the king's men managed to put me back together. Well, most of me. You see, there were some parts that couldn't be healed with bandages and glue. After that day, I became afraid of heights. I was so scared that it kept me from enjoying some of my favorite things. I walked past the wall every day, and I would think about climbing that ladder again. I really missed the birds and being high above the city, but I could never do it because I knew that accidents can happen. I eventually settled for watching the birds from the ground. It wasn't the same, but it was better than nothing. <gasps> then one day, an idea flew by. Making planes was harder than I thought. It was easy to get cuts and scratches. But day after day, I kept trying and trying until I got it just right. My plane was perfect, and it flew like nothing could stop it. I hadn't felt that happy in a long time. It wasn't the same as being up in the sky with the birds, but it was close enough. Unfortunately, 
accidents happen. They always do. I almost walked away again. But then I thought about all the time I'd spent working on my plane and all the other things I'd missed. I decided I was going to climb that wall. But the higher I got, the more nervous I felt. I didn't want to admit it. I was terrified. I didn't look up. I didn't look down. I just kept climbing one step at a time until I was no longer afraid. Maybe now you won't think of me as that egg who was famous for falling. Hopefully, you'll remember me as the egg who got back up. and learned how to fly. The end. Yeah. We're going to talk a little more in Sunday school about the ending of that book, but for now, how about we have a prayer and we'll go to Sunday school. Awesome God, we give you thanks for this wonderful church where we come to be reminded of your gift of grace, which gives us the courage to spread our wings and, like Humpty Dumpty, rise out of our brokenness. It is with grateful and humble hearts we pray and we say together, Amen. Thank you. The reading for today is from the book of Matthew in two parts. It tells about another incident where Jesus goes head to head with the religious authorities. In fact, it's caused by a previous encounter where he outfoxes a different group of scholars on the question of paying taxes to Caesar. Here is the first part from chapter 22. When the Pharisees heard how he had bested the Sadducees, they gathered their forces for an assault. One of their religion scholars spoke for them posing a question they hoped would show Jesus to be a false prophet. Teacher, which command in God's law is the most important? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and intelligence. This is the most important, the first on any list. But there is a second to set alongside it. Love others as well as you love yourself. These two commands are most important because everything in God's law and the prophets descends from them. May these words build up our faith for the days ahead. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Everlasting by God, by your grace, we draw life and breath each day. By your grace, the world is formed and turns. By your grace, we come into being, learn and grow and know one another. And we grow to hold on to one another so that it is hard to let go when your world turns yet again. We ask your presence and comfort in the face of our daily letting go. We ask your grace and comfort, especially on the families of David Brown, and Mary Jokums, for Gwen Reedy and Ed Galen, for all those who have passed and those whom we hold close, we ask for the confidence of your presence that in the days ahead we would, in every moment, live as those going forth to die knowing that in death there is no separation from you, and in you there is no separation from those whom we love. So abide and walk with us each day, in all our trials and tribulations, in all of our brokenness and misspoken words, in all of our joys and our accomplishments, in the small delights that you show each day if we would notice. Help us to find in this constant mix, this turning every day, from light to dark to light again. Help us to know that all these things are from you and are within you, and in faith we may abide in you. This we claim because of the outrageous gift of your presence in Jesus, who sat and walked and talked with us and seemed to be nothing more than another one of us, and yet was filled with your spirit and your wisdom, eager to tell us that we too may know the fullness of your spirit and wisdom. So it is in his name and following as he taught us to pray that we say, Our Father, all of be thy name, thy kingdom come.
Please remain standing for the second part of the story from the Gospel of Matthew, as Jesus now turns on his prosecutors. After Jesus had answered the question about the most important commandment, the Pharisees were regrouping, and Jesus turned the tables, catching them off balance with his own test question. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said, David's son. Jesus replied, well, if the Christ is David's son, how do you explain that David, praying in the spirit, named Christ his master? He said, God said to my master, sit here at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now if David calls him master, how can he at the same time be his son? That stumped them, since they were such literalists. Now they didn't want to risk losing face again in one of these public verbal exchanges. So from that day forward, they didn't dare challenge him in public. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. This Sunday, as I mentioned, though, Reformation Sunday, who knows what it is or who did it? Yeah, you, you don't count me. Yeah, see, yeah. The, the church geeks, the church nerds know all about Reformation Sunday. We are here, we're Protestants, because Martin Luther protested uh, some of the practices and theology of the Catholic Church in his day 500 years ago. This Tuesday on Halloween, All Hallows' Eve, he posted his 95 theses to the door, and Gene, don't give me, get me technical about whether he did or did not actually nail it. That's neither here nor there. The ripple effects are significant, uh, and I encourage you to, if you don't know about it, there's lots, especially right now. Look into it. It's kind of fun, and he's, he is, uh, he's a source of good quotes, a very quotable guy. But let's, uh, let's quote for the record his famous words. He basically called the church into account and said, hey, some of the stuff you're doing ain't, uh, well, ain't, is not kosher, so to speak. And the Pope pulled him in and said, you have to quit saying that, and you've got to, you have got to go on the record and say that you reject everything you have just said. And, of course, he wouldn't. His, uh, his words are, were these. Since your most serene majesty and your high mightinesses, I like that part. Of course, that's from the German. Uh, require of me a simple and clear direct answer, I will give one, and it is this. Unless I am convinced by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I neither can nor will retract anything. Ich kann noch nicht zeruch nehmen. Hier stehe ich, ich kann nicht anders. Gott hilf mir, Amen. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen. This was the beginning of what we now call the priesthood of all believers, that each one of us is responsible for reading the Bible and understanding, for carrying out our faith, that the church is not an intermediary. Nothing comes between us and our relationship with God. Our uh, story today begins with a very smart boy who's doing really well in school, and then all of a sudden his grades plummet. Not all the way, not to Fs, just Ds. Just enough, just enough. But nonetheless, a marked uh, difference. And so his dad sits him down and says, you know, what's going on? The, you were getting great grades, and now you're not. What's happening? And the boy, as 12-year-old boys can be, can do, can say, he says, well, I figured it out. <clears throat> I'm just going to do the minimum, just enough to get by, because that's really all you need to do to get by, is the minimum. His dad said, get in the car. He got in the car, drove about 20 minutes into downtown L.A., and turned the corner and took a tour slowly through L.A.'s Skid Row. 
so the boy could see what perhaps you have seen or heard about, and believe me, it's more than you can imagine. All the worst of what's worse. People sleeping in their own defecation, hungry, begging, crazy. And so after he had the kid's attention, he said, you want minimum? You want just getting by? This is what it looks like to just get by and do the minimum. Guess whose grades shot up in the next quarter? It's a good story of tough love, but I want to invite you into the next chapter. The story of this boy's bar mitzvah, which Karen and I had the privilege of attending just last week. I want to try and make the connection between that and the Reformation and maybe our own spiritual journey. Let's see if we can make that come together. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of these our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O thou who art rock and redeemer. Amen. How many of you have been to a Shabbat service or a bar mitzvah? Some of you? Yeah, good. They're, uh, they're off, they can be very different, just as uh, Christian services of worship can be very different. Uh, we went to, this one was kind of uh, funky and low-key and friendly. You think we're informal and welcoming. This was like, you know, my big, ha fat, Greek happy wedding. You know, it's just so warm and loose and people are running around. All it went, you know, went on for three hours, so there had to be some coming and going. And when the rabbi came to the point of uh, introducing our uh, young man, whose name is Izzy, she uh, introduced him as the smartest kid she'd ever had in bar mitzvah, and also the toughest, one of the most challenging, that he would always, he'd always go right for the hard part of the issue or the question. He was good at pulling that out. And he was argumentative with her, giving her a hard time, never giving quarter. I know him a little bit, and indeed, he's a really smart kid, and he's a real smart aleck, <laughs> as boys that age can be. And what makes him a, a double threat is he's got the most beautiful, charming smile. If this kid got, that doesn't go into sales, he's, he's missing the boat. He, he's just got this smile that's incredible. He's an authentic 13-year-old twerp, and I mean that in a loving way. <laughs> but accurate way. As you would know, in the bar mitzvah, much of, much of the ceremony and the process for that is uh, the student has been studying how to pronounce, how to sing, how to share in leadership of the service. So somewhat like our own liturgist, uh, he was involved in, repeatedly in participating in the prayers, leading the prayers, modeling the singing, which is not easy, reading from the Torah scrolls, etc. I think I got a picture of that where he's yeah, he's getting, he's, he's, he's getting the scrolls to be ready to read. And the bar mitzvah student uh, gets to give what's called a Devar Torah, which is basically a commentary or a discussion on that week's Torah lesson, which, given the schedule, he's able to prepare for well in advance. So it finally comes Izzy's time to stand up and give his Devar Torah and reveal some of what he has learned. And he starts off by insisting that he's not religious and he doesn't believe in God. But I'm Jewish and my parents made me come here, so we're going to do this thing. <laughs> Lucky for him, he gets the very rich story of Noah to talk about. And he proceeds to make a very vigorous, pretty well-informed, sometimes pretty sarcastic case based on the Noah story, and I'm not going to give it away because I'm going to use it later myself, a really good case that in the Noah story, what we see is proof that eating meat is wrong, and it's a strong case for vegetarianism, <laughs> which is his real religion. That's clearly what he is passionate about. By the time that he's done, now everybody knows what the rabbi meant when she introduced him and what his dad knows all too well. At the conclusion of the whole ceremony, the uh, head of the, what would be the equivalent of the trustees for the synagogue uh, comes forward and there's this little ceremonial presentation of a commemorative gift 
And uh, it's his opportunity to make a few comments along the way. And he's, he's quick to say that, you know, he doesn't really know anything. He's not a public speaker. But he's been through bar mitzvah, and he's uh, obviously a regular participant in the life of that uh, Jewish community. And so he affirms to Izzy, he says, let me, let me clue you in here. You don't have to believe in God to be Jewish. Maybe you didn't know that. He says, but in fact, you have already shown that you are a full member of this people of Israel because you have argued with the faith in the Torah. Remember the story, we did this maybe a month ago, remember the story of Jacob wrestling with the angel, and in the morning he comes, comes down to it, and he's not going to let the angel go until he says who, is, who he is, or until he gives him a blessing, and the angel struggles back with him and asks him his name, and he says, my name's Jacob, and he says, no, from this day forward, you shall be called Jacob. Israel, Israel, and he becomes the father of the whole people of Israel from that day forward. And that word, Israel, means to wrestle with God. And so the chair of the trustees basically said, so you're in, you're one of us. You showed and told us how you wrestled with the faith. Tremendous applause. Everybody's like, yeah, got it, nailed it. In essence, Izzy went to his synagogue and, if you would, nailed his vegan theses to the door. Right? Like Martin Luther before him, he was saying, this is how I see it. This part isn't right, and this is what we should do. Which is to say, like any of us I trust, he had issues with the practice of his religion and faith community, and he acted out in that long line of succession that stretches all the way back to that radical rabbi, Jesus, who was doing the very same thing in the lesson today, where he's arguing with the religious authorities, the gatekeepers of his own time. Remember the other time where he's, he's so outraged at what's happening in the holy temple that he flips the offering tables over? That was a part of his wrestling with the institution as it was. In other words, Jesus the rabbi challenged the religious institution of his day, and what happened? Uh, Christianity split off. And here we are today, born out of Judaism. And 500 years ago, this Tuesday, a Roman Catholic Christian priest in Germany took up the hammer and nail and some paper and split the church into what we now know as Protestantism with its thousands of subgroups and denominations. And in the same way, just to keep the ball rolling, 233 years ago, an Anglican Christian Protestant priest named Reverend John Wesley built up such a movement of personal and social holiness in England and the early United States that it became a tidal wave within the Anglican church that they couldn't keep up with it or contain it. He was trying to make the case for social justice within the church, trying to make that case, and uh, they weren't catching up. But it took fire amongst the people, amongst the local folks, amongst the coal miners, amongst the pioneers here in these states, and so... Methodism grew so fast and so was in such desperate need of preachers to keep up with its own growth that Wesley just started ordaining people on his own as, as if he was a church. He didn't intend to be a denomination, but he acted like one. If you wanted to be a preacher back in those days, they'd give you a Bible, a hymnal, and a horse, and away you went. And here we are, the largest connectional denomination in the United States because someone challenged what is with what could be, even should be, which is how it always is and how it keeps happening. Colin Kaepernick taking a knee is his way of nailing a statement about institutional racism to the door of contemporary culture. The actress Rose McGowan has nailed Harvey Weinstein for, and I have to say it, trying to nail her and the whole institutionally sexist culture which enables that kind of behavior. Ugly behavior deserves ugly language. The hot question now is, and it was on, it's on the front page of the paper today. Both, I, you know, I was done with this. And I grabbed the paper when it finally showed up. Here's lead story, 
women talking about sexual harassment within the state legislature. Here's one about uh, the baseball guy. I don't, sorry, I don't follow baseball, but he made a racist uh, gesture and comment in the course of the game. Racism, sexism, still a part of our culture, and who is speaking to it? Who is calling it out? How does that happen? The sense is that finally these movements may be getting enough traction that maybe we'll finally see real change. Will the institutions of racism and sexism finally be reformed, to use the word of today? Could it be that we might be able to move forward into a more humane culture, a more just and civil civilization, what we in the church call the kingdom of God? So let's talk about real reformation. Professor Kenneth Andrews, writing from his studies of the civil rights movement, says that for a change movement, for reformation to stick, it has to have three elements. Cultural power, disruptive power, and organizational or institutional power. Cultural power is the sort of grassroots change that changes language, changes what we're talking about and how we talk about it, changes behavior. It's a change from within that shifts the culture. And we're seeing that in many of the stories now around Weinstein and Cosby and Roger Ailes and make your long list. It's easy. It's in the news. He says movements also have to have disruptive power. And by disruptive, he means that it, it becomes more costly. It becomes too costly to sustain the status quo in the face of the change that is at work. What were we reading this week? Fox News paid $32 million to settle a sexual harassment claim against Bill O'Reilly. It's becoming too expensive to cover up and maintain the status quo. We can see it within our own church on a different issue insofar as some, not all, some branches of the classic Christian church clings to its homophobia and it's costing the church in terms of public perception. The most common reason for millennials, for younger people, for not coming to traditional churches is hypocrisy. They observe that, sure, you preach love, but you practice a prejudiced judgment. So we're not going there. Finally, movements have power when they get organized. Think of simply the labor movement in its day or the civil rights movement that worked to bring about the institutionalization of equality in the form of the Voting Rights Act. Or, in terms of organization and putting together something that makes the change stick, even uh, outside his history scholars point out that part of the success of the spread of Methodism during its time was that Wesley organized those preachers into preaching circuits and the local people into class or band meetings where they met weekly together to pray and hold one another accountable. He put together a system that was able to sustain and build the change that was happening in that time of spiritual movement. Now all of that's at the organizational level. Let me just do a quick footnote and say take each one of those, cultural power where it changes language and behavior, disruptive power when it becomes too expensive to maintain the status quo, and the organizational or institutionalized intentional version of it and think of that in terms of your own spiritual life. If you were experiencing, experiencing a spiritual reformation, how does your language and behavior change? Where does it start to cost you to maintain the status quo? And how do you put into practice a discipline of engaging and paying attention to your spiritual well-being? How do those three reflect a reform for yourself, of your spiritual understanding and identity? All this the, the, is the dynamic of real change. And it seems to me that one of the most helpful ways to, it's one of the more helpful ways to describe the polarization that's in our broader culture that, we're talk, that is just over and over again we're talking about it. And it can be captured in those, those two pieces, movement, like the Methodist movement, or this movement around racism and sexism, and the institutionalization of things. Reform movements are necessary to break the new ground towards a better world for us all. But then, institutions are needed to organize and embed those gains in laws and policies and practices to preserve the best of what we have learned for the future. 
and to set a new baseline for the seeds of the next movement. It's a both and, institution and movement. But right now it seems we're locked between those two as if it's an either or. Either we move towards genuine equality among races and sexes and nations and go forward, or we go backwards and make things great again. Which they weren't. Ask any black person in 1850 before the Civil War, or in 1950 before the Civil Rights Movement, or any black person today. Ask today. All you got to do is read the headlines. We're not done. The movement still needs to move forward. This either-or mode between movement and institution of status quo ignores that both are necessary. We need both halves of the equation. Especially now, when the movement is less about progress than, than not backsliding. Not some progress versus faster progress, but decline, and reversion in place of reform. So for the kingdom of God to come, we need the hammer and the nail of calling it like it is and saying we can do better, there is better, we must do better, and we have to what? Wrestle with both. Wrestle with both. And at the center of that wrestling for reform, before it's cultural or organizational or political or economic or institutional, before it's anything else, it's spiritual. Which is why it was so exciting to see Izzy living out that truth in front of his faith community, even though he doesn't really know it yet. The wrestling is spiritual because it's putting ourselves and our willfulness into relationship with God, where we discover who we are, whose we are, who is our neighbor, and then in that holy trinity of love, working out how we, not just me, can move towards the kingdom. Luther nailed his ideas to the door to, the door to reform the church, and more precisely, how we understand our relationship with God. I'm going to write about that tomorrow on the pastoral update. Watch for it on Tuesday morning. And in like manner, Christ is nailed to the cross to reform our understanding of our relationship to God and therefore our neighbor. It is a spiritual reformation rooted in love, which looks like this. Let me tell you the best part of this whole bar mitzvah. At the end of the whole spiel there, in the third hour, there is an opportunity where the, each of the parents are to give a blessing to the young person who's going through this, uh, through this ritual. That's a, that's a, you know, it's a, a steady part of the tradition within the Hebraic faith of giving blessings. Remember Jacob's wrestling with the angel as he says, I won't let you go until you bless me. So the mom, Izzy's mom, came up, and uh, you could see part of where he got that wonderful smile from. She gave a lovely speech blessing him as he now becomes an adult, an accountable member of the community, it was kind of what you would expect, kind of like a high school graduation speech. It was appropriate to that moment, and everybody applauded when she sat down. And then Izzy's dad got up. And they're up at the, let me see if I get, I don't think I have that particular picture, but they're up, up at the front here, up here at the front of this, the, the synagogue. And Izzy's waiting, you know, it's like, oh, okay, I gotta listen to my dad. Remember the guy that stuffed me in the car? I listened to my dad talk at me again. And so he's standing there, and uh, his dad comes up, and the first thing he does is so cool, he takes the microphone from, from his wife, and he turns and faces Izzy, and he puts the microphone down. So what is he showing us? What is he showing Izzy? Yeah, this, this isn't about performing for everybody here. This isn't about talking to the crowd. This isn't about me looking good as dad. This is between you and me. So then he went on to say, pardon me, it's a really wonderful moment. He said, I'm supposed to give you a blessing. But what I want to tell you is you have blessed me. You have been blessing me from the beginning. And then he proceeds to substantiate that 
and tell Izzy things he might not even remember, tells him the sweetest story about when he first recognized what a tender heart his boy has and why vegetarianism for him really is his statement of faith, of caring for all creation. So he carries out this blessing and he, and he follows up on Izzy's devar, his, his biblical interpretation. He shows that he paid attention, that he listened, that he respected, and he challenged him back just a little bit on some of that because that's also a part of the wrestling. So what did he do? He gave up his authority as father and is now sharing it with his son who has now become a man eligible to be counted as one of the minimum number of six to form a minion of the temple gathering. Now we are equals. He loves his son and makes himself vulnerable. He, what he does, if you would, is reforms that relationship into something it could not be until that moment, making himself vulnerable in love. And you could see, because through this whole three hours, Izzy had been fidgety, fussy, pulling out his prayer shawl. Because ah, 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 you know. he knew he was on stage. Everybody's looking at him to show someone. And in that moment, the change in his demeanor, as now he knows his father's love, and perhaps also now his responsibility in the relationship. He's still going to be a twerp for a couple more years. We know that. But the seed was planted. The reform has become, begun. The everlasting comes to you and to us in Christ every day, saying, let us love one another so that we can stand before one another in any color or gender or identity and say, let us love one another. When we do that, we are taking up hammer and nail to put the world, or, or maybe just our neighbor, or maybe just ourselves, on notice. This may be how it is now, but we can and must do better, for the kingdom of God is coming. Amen. Thank you for this time of worship. You're all invited to join over on the fellowship uh, Brooks Hall for some fellowship time, coffee, cookies, especially if you're here for the first time. We'd love to meet and greet you. Invite you then to join in one of the discussion groups as you see them listed. That and uh, this coming week, more classes before us, opportunities to join in the Christmas choir, all kinds of good stuff happening for this fellowship of faith. Now, may you go and find your inner twerp. <laughs> Embrace it and then grow it that we might find love together.